to be together with you. And for those of you that are new with us in the room, we're so grateful to share this moment with you. And for those of you that are, we get to join you online, we're so grateful to share this time together with you. Uh, for those of you that are new in the room, just a reminder to what was mentioned earlier at the beginning of the service is we would love to give you a gift for being with us today. We're so grateful that we get to share this time. And so at the end of today's service, can you just go to the welcome table? There's going to be a host there and they'd love to give you a gift for being with us. So take the connect card that's located in that seat back of the chair in front of you and fill it out. And if you'll just take that to them, we'd love to give you a gift for being with us today. Hey, Westside, now let's give those that are new with us and those that are online a big warm welcome, letting them know how grateful we are to be here with them. Yeah. Thank you. So we're continuing the series that we have called Counter Culture. What does it mean to follow Jesus in a cancel culture? And last week, if you missed last week, we talked about how this is not new. Living in a cancel culture is not new. This has been a part of, of, of our humanity. As soon as someone disagrees, it's a, a temptation and the, the natural desire is to cancel you out. And so this is not new. And so this is not to raise awareness to the culture around us, but it's to raise awareness to how we need to follow Jesus regardless of what is happening around us this. And here's a series big idea that we've been looking at, and we're going to continue to look at this for the next several weeks. Jesus and scripture direct Christ followers to live counter to culture, not conform to it. That Jesus in scripture is the guiding thing in our beliefs. It's the, what guides our beliefs and our actions. And it's through Jesus and following Jesus in scripture that guides Christ followers. Those of us who say Jesus is our Lord and we're committed to making, that we trust him as our savior. That this is what guides our beliefs and our actions. And it leads us to live counter the culture, not conform to it. Now, if you're new or Jesus may be new to you, um, today I hope that you're going to see something with new eyes. I hope that you have a new perspective today. I want to help you see why we do the weird things that we sometimes do, okay? Why, and there, there are, I want you to know that there, there are a couple things that, that we do as church family. And if you're new to Jesus or you're new to the church and, and, and if you're trying to figure out why we do some of the things that, that we do, I hope that today you see why some of the things we do are counter culture and counter the way that the culture lives because we believe Jesus is life and we believe that Jesus came back to life he resurrected proving that he is life and Jesus would lead his followers he would lead those who believe that he is life and want this life he would lead them to live counter culture and he would live them to live this way, and which is counterintuitive because we hit the way that Jesus teaches is, is upside down the way we naturally think and the way we want to live. Jesus would tell those, and we looked at this verse last week, that Jesus would look at his people and people that he would say, you want to follow me, that if you want the life that I have to offer, this is what it means, that you must deny yourself. He'd say, die to yourself daily or take up your cross daily and follow me. And this is what this first century disciples did. And they lived, and this is how they taught others to live in light of what Jesus had done for them. And then Paul, when he was a man, he was a man in the first century who had his life transformed by the resurrection and knowing who Jesus was. And he dedicated his life to following him. And he would talk to the Roman church. He would write this beautiful book that was this long letter that would now be a part of our New Testament it's called Romans. And he would talk about the gospel, the good news, and what God had done through Jesus for the whole world. And then he would get to this moment in Romans chapter 12. And he would say, therefore, so therefore, in light of everything that I told you about the goodness and the good gospel news and the good news of Jesus, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now just stop right there because in this moment, Jesus, uh, Paul said that in view of Jesus' view, in view of God's view of you and how God views you, you can live totally devoted to him. And the way you live totally devoted to him is this is how he would, in his language, put what Jesus would say, deny yourself, die to yourself and follow him. He would say, this is the living sacrifice this is worship. This is true devotion to God in how you live your life, a living sacrifice. And then he would say, this is how you live it. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, then, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, do not conform but be transformed. See, in order to not conform to the culture around us, Paul says you need to first change how you think. You need to ch- must transform your thinking. See, what controls your thinking controls your life. This is what Paul knew. The Holy Spirit would inspire him to say, don't conform, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Change the way you think because your mindset directs your belief set and your belief set directs how you think live. See, what controls your thinking controls your life. And in this, when thinking, when, when we think, and we, we got to think about this. See, when Jesus in Scripture transform our thinking, we conform to be more like Jesus and less like the world around us. We cannot become more like Jesus if we're not letting Jesus and reading his scripture to guide our beliefs and guide how we live and letting it direct our lives. Paul would say, do not conform to the world, but be transformed in how you think. See, Jesus in scripture changes everything and changes our thinking, especially on two things that you and I and the world around us want most control over. And this gets counterculture. Real fast. And it's not just counter culture the way the world lives. This is counter the culture the way you and I want to live. Because really, you and I want control, isn't it? I mean, if we, I mean, that's really the bottom line. We want control. And what are the two things that we love to control? Our time and our money. Now, before you cancel me out, I just want you to listen to me today. <laughs> And I want to encourage you over the next few minutes because Jesus think, transforms our thinking and Scripture transforms our thinking on the things that you want control most over, your time and your money. And Christ followers, for those of you that are new, we're weird when it comes to our time. We're weird. I mean, after all, this is what we do on a regular basis. We dedicate some time here to come on Sunday. And we also know that we direct our money and we give differently. We spend our money differently and we spend our time differently because Christ and Scripture direct our beliefs and actions. And here's the thing that I know about the culture around us. See, culture is competing for your time, and it's competing for your money. Culture will bait you to the edge to overextend yourself, to spend more time than you should spend and overcommit in your time. And culture wants to bait you to the edge to spend more than you should on in, in, in with your money. It's ultimately a competition for your and my devo- devotion. This is what culture wants to influence. It wants to influence on you on how you spend your time and how you spend your money. I mean, think about Facebook. Think about things like Facebook and, and you know, TikTok. I mean, TikTok, you know, like that, the whole thing that they do there. So in this, um, I just showed you that I am not on TikTok, didn't I? Um, <laughs> so don't look me up there. Um, in this, Think about it. When is the last time that you thought, man, they, they really put a time limit on. They want me to get off Facebook. They want me to get off these social media platforms. I mean, think about Amazon. Amazon wants you to spend more money. This is why when you're around somebody and you know they bought something, it's just automatically, wow, this showed up in my, and then you think they're watching you. <laughs> And it shows up in your feed on a device because they want you to spend more money. They want you to do this. They, 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 this might be the same reason some of you are just shopping right now or on Facebook right now because it's competing. Now, it's okay if you are. That's not to put guilt on any of you or any of you online that's got another browser window open. It doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> See, culture wants to command your time and culture wants to command your money. It wants you It wants to take control, and it's in all of us. We want to control our time and money. And but Scripture and Jesus lead us to counterculture, not conform to the culture, but when it comes to our time and the money, but to show the world that we live counterculture and that He controls everything we think, say, and do. So in this, to follow Jesus, if you the reason I'm going to put this teaching big idea up the front is because if you check out or you just cancel out today, you know that I just gave you what I believe, okay, and what we see in scripture. So here it is, to follow Jesus, we make Jesus the first priority with our time and the money. To follow Jesus, we make Jesus the first priority with our time and money. See, this is what Jesus 
through Scripture, directs the church or the family of God to prioritize how you use your time, how you spend your time, and how you use your money, and how you spend your money. And it is so counterculture, and actually, it's counter what we want to do. This is counter what we want to do. See, culture, here's the reality. Is culture really isn't baiting you. It's not enticing you or marketing toward you because it wants to benefit you. Culture wants you to think it's, it will make you better, but that's not the reason they think, want you, to make it, want you to think it's better for you is because they're more worried about their bottom line. This is marketing. This is salesmanship. And that's what they do to promote it so you want to buy it. And who really benefits? They do. See, culture at large doesn't care about you culture at large cares about the bottom line and culture at large is selfish not selfless and christ followers we have a different ethic we we live by a different code and scripture shows us that god cares for us and god calls his people to put him first with their time and money and when you and i put God first with our time and our money, it leads us to live selflessly when we put him first. See, in a, in, and this is what he does, and in, in God directs us, and he's directed us since the beginning of time to put him first. And I want to show you this through scripture today, that he challenges us to, he, he directs us in this pattern is to put him first in our finances and put him first with our time. So let's just talk about the least offendable uh, topic, time. Okay, we'll put money on the side here. Let's talk about the time. Since the beginning of time, God has set a pattern in the world that God has directed humanity to benefit from this pattern since the onset of creation. Six days, God created the world, and on the seventh day, God rested. And God rested not because he, he was tired. He rested because this was the model to follow. And this is what he knew, that we would be created. And he would set a limit on us. We were made with boundaries. He is limited, limitless, but we are limited. And in this, God would put this law into work. And it's not a law like we would read about it in the Old Testament, which we would later become a part of the Mosaic law. This predates that because it's like the law of gravity. You know the law of gravity? If you break the law of gravity, it kind of breaks you. I mean, I'll let you think about that and just you can think about that later. But really, this is kind of like that law. When you practice putting God first in your time, it's actually to your benefit. But if you don't, it can break you because you're limited. You're not limitless. And in the Old Testament, in this Genesis account that we see this, God modeled this, and God would encourage the Israelites when he would deliver them from Israel. He would remind them of the Sabbath day, and he would say, I want this to be a part of your daily and weekly and lifelong rhythms to honor a Sabbath, to rest. And in this, he would say, observe the Sabbath in Deut Deuteronomy chapter 5. He would say, honor, this, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, which means set apart, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath, look at this, to the Lord your God. It's not a Sabbath day to you, but it's a Sabbath to the Lord. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. This is, you don't understand how beautiful this is. Because in a day and age that lives so selfishly, and, and it was known that you would have all these other things and you would work them to death. God comes in the middle of this nation of Israel and said, this is not for you and them. I want to show you that this is, this is not for you to manipulate and to abuse others. This is actually for all people, not just you and your sons, but it's for your male and female. So listen to the command, how caring this command is. It's for the foreigner. It's for the workforce. It's even for creation. Today of rest, it's for you. And this was a precedent unlike any other nation had. This was counterculture. It's a, in a culture that had servants and foreigners residing, and they would abuse them and misuse them and mistreat them. God would say, no, this is not just a command for my people, but this is a command for all that are under your care. In this, in the, 
This was a day of rest because God cares for all people. And then he would go on to say, remember, verse 15, that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. A day of rest, devotion. A day of rest and a day of devotion to the Lord. And this set them apart. And look at this. This was how they were to live because of what God had done for the nation of Israel in bringing them out of Egypt. You remember last week I said something, if you were here with us last week, I said, we don't live for our salvation. We live from our salvation. And here, the nation of Israel, this is what God said, because I saved you, because I delivered you, I want you, because of what I've done for you, this is now how you should live. Israel was to follow this because God already saved them. God already protected them and already provided for them and delivered them. And he showed his devotion to them. And because they sh- God showed his devotion to them, this is a way that they could be devoted to him. Remember the Sabbath. See, Israel honored God by honoring the Sabbath, a day devoted to God, recognizing that God is their deliverer and provider. See, to cease work for one day every week to honor God was a reminder that God was their protector and their provider. And this was an act of trust that God would continue to provide and they would continue to, God would continue to protect them. And this act of obedience, this, this act of Sabbath was both obedience and worship because that's exactly what obedience is to God. Obedience is worship. It's an act of faith. It's an act of trust. It's saying we trust that you will continue to provide. So we're going to follow your command to rest. And we will not worry about our provision. And we're not going to worry about our protection. So we're going to rest and trust in a God who cares for us. This is an act of faith. Now, another act of faith is giving God the first 10% of what we make. Now, before you cancel me out because I just brought money into this, I want to show you that this is not just because it's in the Old Testament law because some people say that tithing is just an Old Testament law. And I want to show you that this predates the Old Testament law. And I want to also show you in a minute, in a a couple minutes, that Jesus endorses this. And in this, in Genesis, we read that God revealed himself to a man named Abram. If you know the story of of, of Abram, Abram actually has, uh, God, he was barren, had no kids, and God tells him, I'm going to make you into a nation. And the miracle behind this is Abram was 90 years old. And so in this, God gives Abram and his wife Sarai a, a, a child, and he tells them this promise. He changes their name to Abraham. This child eventually gives birth to a son that becomes the nation of Israel. And all of this, all of this, he, God does this for this man. And in this moment that we read in Genesis, God delivers I- Abram from some enemies. And then Abram goes to the king of Salem, whose name is Melchizedek, a name that I would never suggest you look in the Bible to f- name your kid after this name. It'll make them be made fun of, guaranteed. And in this, this he goes to Melchizedek, and he, which is the king of Salem, and we read this, that then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brings out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. This is what he does from the salvation that God gave him. And then Abram, then Abram gave a tenth of everything. Before this was ever a command in scripture, this was a response to God's goodness and God's provision. This was the pattern that was followed. And Abram gave from what God had already given him. Because God saved Abram, Abram devoted a tenth before it was ever even made a law. See, Abram didn't live for his salvation. He lived from his salvation. And this is why he gave a tenth. And this is why we continue, we'll see this model through the Old Testament and New, to give a tenth. It's, a tenth is also in, in the, the language, is, is interchangeably used as a tithe. But which tenth is very important? Because it's not the last tenth. It's actually, we're going to see the first 
10%. And after God would deliver the Israelites from Egypt, God would tell them to bring the first of their crops to him. And we read this in Exodus chapter 23, in the ceremony that he wanted them to remember, the ceremony, he wanted them to annually remember what God did for the nation of Israel and bringing them out of Egypt. He wanted them to remember their salvation. And so no one, we read in verse 15, is to appear before me, this is God speaking through Moses, no one's to appear before me empty-handed. Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits. I want you to circle that word first fruits, it's meaningful. He goes, with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. That word first fruits comes from this word bakurum, which is this Hebrew word, and it literally means the promise of things to come. It's the promise of things to come. This would be a pattern that God would ask them to give not just the first fruits of their harvest, but the first fruits of their animals, the first male, uh, whatever animal it was, they would offer it as a sacrifice. And in a world that agriculture was their income and provision, they didn't know if they would have another male to help procreate that line or that, 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 that flock. But God would say, do this because your act of trust is an act of, you're, this is an act of worship, trusting that I will always provide for you. See, when you give your, from the first 10%, it's an act of trust that God will provide in the future. It's an act of belief, an act of faith that everything you have and everything you own, it already belongs to God and it's come from him and he's given it to you. And your worship is just to give back 10 in Leviticus, the author reminds the Israelites that of what God spoke through Moses regarding the first of their income. And this is what he says to this world where agriculture was money to them. A tithe of everything, a tenth of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Notice that he says it belongs to the Lord. It's set apart unto him. This is why... God would speak through the prophet Malachi in Malachi chapter 3 in verses 10 and following. He would ask the people, why do you rob me by withholding what already belongs to me, the tithe? Why do you rob me in this? See, this is the reason it's counterculture to believe that God owns everything that we have. See, it's counterculture to believe that everything we have and everything we are and everything that we, we don't really own it, it actually belongs to him. And this is the act of faith recognizing that. He owns it and he loans it to you and I. And this is why giving the first 10% is an act of obedience to God, a recognition that all belongs to him and an act of trust that God will provide so we put him first in our time and we put him first in our money now you might say casey that's old testament we show this to me in the new testament show me where jesus talks about this well i want to show you both where new testament and specifically jesus talks about both our time and our money so let's talk about our time first see jesus talks about our time jesus upheld the sabbath as a day devoted to god as a day of rest devoted to god and the disciples continued to do the same and they even did it in greater proportion. I'll show you that here in a second. See, in the, this is the life that Jesus modeled and a life that we are to follow. On the Sabbath day, he, uh, we, we read in uh, Luke chapter 4 that this was his custom. And he, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. And Luke says this was his custom. This is what he regularly did. And Jesus wouldn't just do this act of worship on the Sabbath. He would do something greater. He actually changed what the people saw the Sabbath to be. And, and he would change he, what he, it was. He would claim. He would make the claim that he was Lord of the Sabbath in Matthew 12, verse 8. In, in Mark 2, verse 22, Jesus would even say that man wasn't made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath, he ties us back to the creation count, the Sabbath was made for humanity. This is why we have the Sabbath. This was for our benefit because he's a God who cares for us. And Jesus would use the Sabbath then because it was for the benefit of the people. He would use the Sabbath to set people free. He would save them from their sins and he would set them free from the brokenness in their life. And not just in the brokenness through sin, but the brokenness through sickness. And he would deliver them and set them free from the burdens and bondages that sickness and sin would bring. This 
would be one of the main reasons that the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day would arrest Jesus and have him executed. Because how they thought he opposed the Sabbath, but what he did is he clarified what the Sabbath day is all about. And they would then persecute him, whip him, beat him, and then execute him. And then three days later, on the day after the Sabbath, the first day of the week, Jesus would rise again. And in this pattern, Jesus was resurrected of the first day of the week. And and Jesus' resurrection would set a new pattern in motion for the first century church. His recognition would change, his resurrection would change everything. See, his resurrection would guarantee that the promise of life that he claimed to be was for all who would trust in him and follow him. And, And would trust in him as the savior of their sins, the deliverer from their sins. And in this shift that occurred, the disciples continued to meet together regularly. And they would meet together. They would go to the temple courts and they would meet together in the Sabbath. And they would also meet together on the first day of the week. I want you to see this. See, in this, in, in Acts chapter 13, we read that the Sabbath that they entered, that Paul and Barnabas, who were there, they entered the synagogue and sat down. And, and, and on the Sabbath day, um, and, and on the Sabbath day, they enter the synagogue and, and, and sat down. And then on verse 42 of chapter 13, you can read this a little later. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about this on the next Sabbath. And then on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. So they gathered together. This was a part of their routine. And so they gathered to listen to this. And then we read in Acts chapter 20, something they would do in the first day of the week. And you may ask, why do we not worship on Saturday, but we worship on Sunday? It's because of the pattern that the New Testament church set. And in this, on the first day of the week, the first day, the recognition of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because the resurrection of Jesus really changes everything. On the resurrection of Jesus of the week, we came together. We came together. We gathered together to break bread. And Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, in verse 7, he says he kept on talking until midnight. So get ready. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. See, this was a day devoted to being with God's family, the first day of the week. They said, because what God did for us, we're going to make him first in our time, in the first day of the week. We're going to devote it to his family. This is why gathering together is so important. This is how we live from our salvation that is guaranteed through the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. We give the first day of our week and devote it to him. See, we give the first day of our week as a time to gather with Jesus' family because loving one another is how we love God. Loving one another is how we show our devotion to God. Jesus would say, if you love me, you'll love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. As I lived, died, and came back to life to give you life and as an expression of my love, now they would continue this and they would gather together. They would sacrifice the first of their week and devote it to what was most important to God, his family, his kingdom, the people of his kingdom. And they gave time to be with each other as an act of worship. And they also gave their money as an act of worship. See, Jesus directs his followers to put him first in their finances. And you may think that to give your time is all you need. and That's like giving your money. But Jesus challenges that thought. That, that giving your time does not mean you have a free pass to not give your money. Jesus says it's both. And this is where I believe he endorses the tithe as well as giving of your time. And in this moment, he's talking to the Pharisees. These Pharisees are religious people that thought that they could do enough good for God to love them. And that's what religion is, is do to get God's favor on you. But that's not what Christ did. See, Christ did it all. And we respond out of the gratitude of our hearts. That's what true religion is. And he would say, woe to you Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. See, Jesus endorses the tithe here. He says, you should have done both, not just with your time. You need to give your time and not stop giving the 10% of your tithe. See, there is a cultural drift that says we don't need to tithe. But Jesus clearly says that this 
is what we, we, we give our time in addition to what we give. And we counter culture. And he counters culture, and even the church culture of that day. And maybe even the church culture of our day is that we need to give. And Jesus teaches also that we give to his kingdom first. In Matthew 6, he's very clear. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where your treasure is, your heart is going to be there also with your treasure. And he would later say in a couple verses later, no one, he's connecting the dots even more, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God, both God and money. And then he would say, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. And the things that we want to control because we're worried about our provision and our protection, he says, don't worry about you, what you eat or drink, your provision, and, or about your body, what you will wear, your protection. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? And then Jesus gives some examples of how God cares for all of his creation much more, and much more those of us who are created in his image. And then he says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all those things that you want to control in life all those things you're worried about in life they'll be given to you as well they'll be given to you as well you know what i have a fear of is that sometimes we love jesus but we still are seeking our kingdom And so I want to ask you, whose kingdom are you living for? Because when we realize what Christ has done for us, we recognize that our devotion should be in everything in him because of all he's done for us. And if Jesus' words are true because of the resurrection of Jesus, then we know that where your money goes, your heart follows. Where your money goes, your heart follows. And this is why we are devoted by putting him first in our money. See, when we give to the local church that is on Jesus' mission to expand his kingdom by making disciples, we are giving to his kingdom. His kingdom, which is about the transformation of all of our hearts, that, that this, the brokenness of sin can be renewed by the truth of the resurrection of Jesus and what he lived, died, and did for us to make us a part of his family. This is the most important thing for our world. This is more important than any need our community has. And the church, the local church, is the voice piece, is the demonstration of this good news. And this is why the local church is so important to why giving to the local church needs to be a priority in our life. And this is what the first century's disciples did. They made this. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, that on the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. See that in keeping with your income. So that when he comes, no collections will have to be made. And they would use this, and the apostles would use this to advance the kingdom of God in, through the local church. And this is what the disciples did. They practiced what all the narrative of Scripture shows us. And the reality, it was to advance his kingdom. And we get to be a part of it. See, the first century church set aside the first of their income for the local church to expand the kingdom of God. And I want to ask you, what would it look like if we did this again? What would it look like for a community to commit our time to gather together with each other out of our expression of our love for God? This is why we show up. This is why we come to life groups. This is why we connect, not just here on Sunday, but during the week. And, and if you had to choose one or the other, I would rather you meet with a small group of people and be connected to the low, big, this, this community as often as you can. But this is why we are gathering together, because of our commitment, and it's out of God's love for us. This is our love for him. We love one another. And we put him first with our time, and we also put him first with our money. And here's a thing I just want to challenge you with. Sometimes we don't do this. Because we are selfish, we're not denying ourselves, dying to ourselves, and following him. So I want to leave you with three questions, something for you to think about. These are the questions I want you to talk about on your way home. First is this, will you commit to loving God by regularly giving or regularly gathering with your local church so you can love one another? Will you make this commitment? And what's that commitment look like? What's this need to look like? 
If we're going to follow him and show that on our time he's first, what does this commitment look like to you? Second question is this, is will you commit to giving the first of your income to your local church? And as a follow-up question, what percentage can you start with? While tithe is this, it, we see it, it's endorsed by Jesus, it may be hard to begin there. But maybe you can start with 2%, 1%. And you can grow in your increasing number. And you're giving because it's not because the church needs your money. It's because God, this is the way that we follow him. We are devoted to him. And we're following him. And we're making his kingdom first. Can I pray for us as we leave today? Father, thank you for loving us and showing us your love by dying for us. Thank you for showing us how committed and devoted you are to us. And through that commitment, may we recognize that we can be devoted to you, that we can love you, and we can put you first in our time, and we need to put you first in our finances. Because God, we know that this is truly what's best for your people, and we want to honor you in all of this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our prayer partners are going to be